Thank you all. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Tonight, we're going to take a fascinating look at how the art of sound and the art of movement come together in the art of ballet. Now, New York City Ballet is well known as having the highest possible regard for live music with dance, and it'll be that way tonight. We have generous helpings of dance, live dance for you tonight with live music, interspersed with some conversation with none other than Andrew Litton. It's wonderful to be with you tonight. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, Andrew, you have been a conductor working with great orchestras of the world, and a couple of years ago you came to America's leading ballet company as music director. What was behind that decision? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And actually, if you had asked me um, two years ago whether I'd be sitting here talking about this, I would have said, you're, you're insane. Um, <laughs> I, I've actually, at this point in time, been conducting professionally for 35 years. But I never somehow imagined I'd be uh, conducting for, for the, the world's best ballet company. And what happened is, um, I was invited to conduct Capella in February of 2015. And I'd always had a fascination for ballet. In fact, my very first professional engagement ever as a musician. Uh, I was a pianist at Juilliard, first year pianist at Juilliard. I was 18. And the phone rang one night, and it was uh, one of my best friends, slightly older student. And he said, Andy, that's what I was called then. Andy, you got to do me a favor. I said, what is it, Bill? He said, I got, a f I got called to play with some guy named Rudolf Nureyev on, on, <laughs> on Broadway. And I can't do it. I, I, it's the one other week in the year that I have, have something else, and I couldn't get out of it. I said, what's the repertoire? He said, Bach, Busoni, Toccata, and Fugue in D minor. I'm like, OK, that's very hard. Go on. Schubert, Trout, Quintet. I'm like, OK, that's also really hard. And I didn't know at that point. And finally, a Cole Porter ballet arranged by a then almost unknown William Balcom for 10-piece ensemble. Um, I said, let me think about it for five minutes. Well, you know what it's like when you're 18, fearless. So I called back five minutes later. I said, I'll do it. And it was an amazing experience. And um, frankly, I went from being Juilliard pianist number 199 out of 200 it's overnight to being, oh, that's that guy who played on Broadway. So mm -hmm. it, did, it did a lot for me. But um, the, the aftermath of that is I, I got invited to play for a lot more ballet as a pianist. And in 1980, two years later, uh, Makarova formed a dance company uh, that was also on Broadway, then called the Eurus Theater, now the Gershwin Theater. And she had six ballets that went in the four-week season, three of which were piano ballets or keyboard ballets. One was on harpsichord. And um, so I, I had a great time. I mean, never forget uh, one of the pieces was with Makarova and Anthony Dowell. It was uh, Ravel's Gaspard de la Nuit. And an incredibly difficult, one of the most difficult solo piano pieces. And I bring it into my piano lesson of one, one day, and, and my great, great Russian piano teacher, Nadia Reisenberg, uh, says, uh, I didn't ask you to learn this. Um, I said, oh, I'm playing it somewhere. She said, when, next year? I said, no, next week. <laughs> she practically, really, literally, almost threw me out of, of her studio. But I invited her and her crazy theremin-playing sister, Clara Rockmore, to the 14th performance. And of course, by then, I was pretty <laughs> solid on it. And uh, she had to admit it wasn't bad, but, um, which was kind of nice. But the reason why I'm telling this very long Shaggy Dog story is <laughs> there was a girl in the core of that company that I fell in love with. And she had just gotten into the New York City Ballet. And so I started stalking her. No, not really stalking, but. Um, <laughs> I, I, we started going out, and I went to performances almost every night when, when you know, practicing and whatever would allow. And I, had, I made friends with an usher who would literally let me sneak in. This was back in the days when it was a little easier to sneak into places. And so I got to know the repertoire of the New York City Ballet in the most hothouse fashion. You know, suddenly I was exposed to all these pieces. And just yesterday I was talking with Tyler Peck about Fancy Free and saying, you know, when I first saw it, it was new in this, in this, you know, in this, to this company, which is so funny to me. You know, now years later, I'm, I'm giving a lecture about it to the audience on Wednesday night, and it, it's just really funny how it's all come full circle. So I never thought in a million years I'd be music director of a ballet company until suddenly I was asked, would you like to be music director of the New York City Ballet? And I just suddenly went, well, it's going to be a huge challenge because for 35 years, I've decided the tempo. 
and suddenly I've, I've basically given that right to the choreographers, to the dancers. And so I thought, well, that's going to be a ch the first challenge. The second challenge, and the one that was really kind of a turn on for me, is the repertoire, which the City Ballet does, is so much more interesting in a way than the kind of rut we get into as symphony orchestra conductors because you're so worried about your audience. You know, will they come? Will they come? And, you know, a little bit later, we're going to talk about the Here and Now Festival that the City Ballet is doing as we speak, starting next week. And the list of composers that were performing over those four weeks would empty any concert hall, and yet our, <laughs> our ballet house right. is going to be full. And, and so that's what I find fascinating. And one of the things that was most intriguing to me is, as a symphony orchestra conductor, I basically knew five Stravinsky pieces, because that's all that comes up. Rite of Spring, Firebird, Petrushka, the violin concerto, and you know, if you work with a chamber orchestra, yes, you do sometimes Apollo, and, and I guess Dumbarton Notes. I've done Dumbarton Notes once in 35 years. Here, they do all of this music regularly, and we're going to talk in a, in a second, I guess, about, about Stravinsky and Balanchine, but I really was excited about the idea of getting to conduct 13 other Stravinsky pieces that, I, that just don't get done at all. So, so that was one aspect of it that was very exciting to me. Yeah, clearly. Well, let's get right to that Stravinsky Balanchine because, okay. cause, uh, I mean, Balanchine had obviously a very special relationship with Stravinsky's music. Yeah. And uh, he, he, I think they were connected at the hip somehow, uh, yeah. artistically. Um, they'd known each other their whole lives. When Balanchine uh, first got hired by Diaghilev, as a, as a 20 year old, I don't know, he was really young. Stravinsky, not that much older, was working there writing, writing these ballets. And um, so they've known each other for a very long time. And of course, Stravinsky then wound up writing Agon for us, for the company. Um, but Balanchine went ahead and, and choreographed all these works. And Stravinsky wrote, so I got out my, my crib sheet. Stravinsky wrote about Balanchine in 1963. To see Balanchine's choreography is to hear music with one's eyes. And I just thought that that was cool. Um, and so for me, the later Stravinsky pieces are maybe not as great masterpieces as the early pieces that really changed history, like the Rite of Spring. But Balanchine's choreography puts it over the edge. For example, the Violin Concerto, which we're going to hear Sterling Hilton talk about in just two seconds. Um, it's, it's not done that often by violinists, but we play it almost every, every year. It's amazing when you add the choreography to the music. Yeah, so let's see that now. We've, okay. we've got a video queued up to watch uh, some of the violin concerto with Sterling Hilton uh, commenting. I remember when I first danced Stravinsky violin, I hadn't really done anything quiet on stage and I didn't know how to create that world around me. That was the most difficult thing about this ballet. Stravinsky Violin Concerto was choreographed in 1972 by George Balanchine with music by Stravinsky. Each section is completely differently structured. It's like a really wonderful three course meal. I think that the first section is very much like an appetizer. You kind of get a different combination of each principal dancer. There's four in total. And in the center of the ballet, there's two pas de deux that are completely different. The first aria, there's sort of this contortion aspect to it. There's even moments that they sort of do things that remind me of a mime. In Stravinsky Violin Concerto, I dance the second aria. The ballet doesn't have a plot, but I like to come up with a story in my head and it helps give focus to my dancing. The second aria sort of has this romantic quality I think it starts out like a conversation. It seems like there's sort of this give and take. The woman wants to stand on her own, but she needs the man to support her in moments.
There's a vulnerability that I feel in my pas de deux. And there's a lot of trust, even though there's vulnerability. There's this beautiful moment where the man has his hand under my chin and he goes back and forth. And I feel like he's showing me the world and it's sort of like if a, a woman fell in love with a much older man for her first love. In the end, he takes her eyes and, he, and they go backwards together and he kneels behind her while she bends back. And it's, it sort of means the end of that relationship. What I really love about dancing this ballet is that you go through a whole spectrum of emotion. There's sort of this tension when you're dancing by yourself. Then you get this pas de deux that's incredibly romantic. And then the finale is just sort of this bacchanal of just everybody dancing together. And it's so much fun. <laughs> Well, she said she said a lot there, didn't she? she yeah, she that's why I love that. I love yeah. that film, and it's so interesting to hear it from a dancer's perspective and realize that we're actually we're actually both saying the same thing, but from from our our own unique uh, vantage points. Um, one of the fascinating things that Balanchine does rhythmically that I find so amazing to watch, um, as long as it doesn't confuse me in my beat patterns, is he will sometimes choreograph against the beat on purpose. And with Stravinsky, that works in a fascinating way. And he will also sometimes do what we in music call a himiola, where he'll put a completely different rhythm against the prevailing beat. So if you've got a prevailing beat, he'll do, you know, on stage with the dancers. And it all winds up perfectly. So he's adding a, an even more complex rhythmic feature to an already complex rhythmically uh, music. So, um, the, the one piece that I was most looking forward to conducting uh, and as I got this job was Stravinsky's Symphony in Three Movements, which is, I think, a masterpiece. From, it's from 1944, just never gets done in concert because it's A, incredibly difficult and orchestras don't know it, and B, it's only 22 minutes long, so it's not a second part of a concert, and it's too hard to use as a starter, because you never want to use all your rehearsal time on just the opening piece. So yet uh, you come to it with the city ballet and the orchestra doesn't almost have the music open. You know, they, <laughs> they, they play it so often, the New York City Ballet Orchestra. So it's, it, I knew it would be really fun to go in and, and, and actually conduct it with an orchestra that already had the, the groundwork done. Um, but this is a, a, a further example of what I'm talking about, because as much as I love the piece I think I love the piece more because of Balanchine's choreography. And we have another bit of film from the third movement to, to show you what I'm talking about. Yeah, please. We have some real live dancers for you now, so uh, we're, we're going to move on to that. All we're right. going to talk about uh, Bach next. Um, 
No, no, we're going to round out our uh, okay. Stravinsky section here with some live dancers. In that video, by the way, we were watching Tyler Peck and Daniel Ulbricht. Um, and now we actually have some live Balanchine Stravinsky with a pas de deux from the Firebird. That's great. Uh, so please welcome Ashley Bowder, Zachary Catarazzo, uh, sorry. Catarazzo, sorry. Uh, with Susan Walters at the piano. Thank you.
wonderful. Wow. It's so incredible. I'm, and I was just privileged enough to, to get to conduct them in that uh, oh last season. Gosh. It's, it's, oh it's amazing. Gosh. And you really, uh, Ashley, when she does Firebird, you really think you're seeing a bird. You know, it's not Ashley. It's suddenly a bird. It's fantastic. And that's also Balanchine, too, you know, of course. So the combination is great. At the outset, you mentioned something about tempo and different <laughs> conceptions of tempo. And perhaps now we'll begin to talk about some of the challenges yes, of working with right. in the, on the music side of the ballet world. Um, you've queued up for us a very interesting demonstration about different concepts of tempo. Yeah, well, you know, there's the old joke of the conductor saying to the, to the ballet master, do you want it too fast or too slow? Um, <laughs> and, and unfortunately, it's really not that much of a joke. Um, uh, but um, there are some times when a choreographer cannot be blamed for too slow, too slow a tempo. And one of Balanchine's most famous ballets is a perfect example of that, Concerto Barocco, which is from the 1940s. The Balanchine set the Bach double concerto. In the first half, up until the first half of the 20th century, really basically, basically up till the 1970s or 80s, we had a very different conception of how Baroque music should be played. And in fact, the 19th century left us with um, a lot of barnacles that led us to believe that tempos were very slow, you're supposed to play Bach, which can sound incredibly romantic if, if it's played that way, um, played in the most romantic manner possible. And since then, scholarship has prevailed that's proven that the tempos should be much faster. And um, in fact, virtually no vibrato. I still happen to love vibrato, so I'm a bit of a dinosaur. But, um, What's interesting is, of course, Balanchine had no way of foretelling that the tempos he chose for Concerto Barocco would be so completely out of fashion half a century later. But I thought I'd prove this to you and show it to you. So first, we'll start with Robert Irving conducting from 1975. Here's the first movement. So now let's hear how my friend Hilary Hahn plays it with the LA Chamber Orchestra from 2014. So now we'll return to Robert Irving for the second movement and see how beautifully and stately his tempo goes. absolutely beautiful at that tempo, but scholars tell us that's not how it's supposed to go. Here's a, a modern recording with my friend Laris St. John and the New York Baroque soloists. This is, sorry, that was, uh, now we're going to do the third one. This is Robert Irving. Third and we 
return to Hilary Hahn for her view on the third movement. <laughs> So the most fun part of this last three minutes for me was hearing all the tittering backstage from the dancers. <laughs> you could just see them flying into the wings <laughs> um, or going to the hospital, one or, one or the other. Um, so. so now we have a live demonstration of this tempo issue. Yeah, okay, well this is, this is actually, this is where it gets personal. Um, uh, when I first started a year and a half ago, uh, I was out of town, so not able to be a participant in the creation of Christopher Wielden's American Rhapsody, which is set to Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. Um, it's, Rhapsody in Blue is, well, Gershwin in general, is, he's one of my heroes, and in some parts of the world, I'm kind of even considered an expert on, on his music, having spent so much of my life doing it. And so I've made three commercial recordings of Rhapsody in Blue, two as a pianist as well. And so I thought, well, at least I'll send Mr. Wielden one of my recordings so he can see what I think the tempo should be. Um, and um, I know he received it. I don't know if he listened to it. Um, and, and actually, um, he, um, he did listen to a recording that he grew up with that he really insisted on basing his ballet on. And so our dancers are gonna be a very good sport. Now, I'm gonna play a certain passage the way I would play it and they're gonna try and dance to it. <laughs> so. The, 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 the problem is this, is this is a little unfair because they are so good that they made it look possible. I mean, <laughs> if Wielden were here, he'd absolutely, well, he'd be in the hospital by now if he had seen, if the choreographer had seen that. But, all right, let's try it again once you catch your breath. And I'll try, I see, I don't have to play it this way, fortunately, but um, I will try and do what you're expecting. Okay. <laughs>
so. Um, so what's, what's really interesting is, of course, that looked much better. Um, I'm not going to say whether I thought it sounded much better because I like my job. Um, but you can read between the lines. But therein lies the fascinating thing that I've learned in my 15 months on the job. Some choreographers choreograph to the music and other choreographers make the music fit the choreography. That doesn't mean either one is wrong. It's just a totally different way of doing business. And Balanchine always made the choreography fit the music. So that's why he's my hero. But in any case, <laughs> um, so uh, with the exception of when he didn't know that Baroque music practice would change in 50 years, then he, he's forgiven. All right, we have one more excerpt, and I'm going to try and play it your way. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Yeah, sir. There you have it. to tell you, it's really hard to play it that slowly. <laughs> you get so used to, you know, this sort of like a pew, uh, approach. But, um, you know, I, I also just want to tell everybody, because maybe you don't know, we all had a performance this afternoon. Every single person you're seeing danced between the hours of 3 and 5.30, and I conducted, and he played. Yeah. Susan, Kurt, Kurt was concertmaster, big solos in, in uh, the, the Hindemith Fortis, and Susan was the soloist in Allegro Brillant, which is the Tchaikovsky third piano concerto. So oh um, just to spare a little thought for <laughs> us. <laughs> but I'm just in, so in such awe of all my new colleagues. They're, they're absolutely amazing. And, and as you know, I don't have to tell you that, but as you can see and hear for yourself. So it's just a real thrill. Indeed. Uh, could you walk us through a little bit how you prepare the music, you know, what, what are the steps? From the time you know what the program is, you have a score of the music, you know, your score is the book with all the notes that all the orchestra musicians play. You need to know what the choreography is gonna be. How do you get from that to opening night? Okay, well, there's, there's many components of that, and I'll try and talk quickly, because I know we've got a lot more still to, yes. to show. Um, 
the, uh, first of all, let's say a third of the music is music I've done before as just a, you know, on stage myself without dancers. So those pieces I don't need to learn from scratch. But next week I'm conducting two ballets that are completely new to me. One we're gonna play you some excerpts of in a few minutes, Russian Seasons, and the other is called Namuna. So with completely new ballets like that, I get the um, library at the, at the Koch Theater to give me uh, videos of past performances. And um, in the case of older ballets, uh, like all the ones we, we did this afternoon, which are all Balanchine ballets, I try and get performances from when he was still alive. So if any current ballet master says, it's too slow or too fast, I can say, well, when Mr. B was alive, this was the tempo. Um, the other thing I have going for me is that Robert Irving apparently really liked faster tempi, so it's like, yes. Um, but <laughs> in any case, I always then get a mix, and I'm really blessed to have the most amazing fellow colleagues, conductors on the staff, starting with the associate music director, Andrew Sill, who is, I think, here somewhere. Um, but he has been a godsend to me, because I really, I walked in the first day like a deer in the headlights. Uh, okay, what's, what's first? And he says, well, first, you need to go to this rehearsal and this rehearsal and this rehearsal. And what happens is that the new part of this e equation for me is that I'm not just preparing the orchestra, which of course I do, but I also have to go to the dance rehearsals to learn the cues and to learn the tempi, all joking aside, and to observe um, all, the, all that sort of interaction. So um, I don't have to come until the final stages of that, so I'm not sitting there while they're learning steps, but I am sitting there while things are being tweaked. And then we have things called completes, which are piano rehearsals with the stage. Um, and those are Peter Martin's, if they're, you know, the older ballets or his, one of his ballets, he's always there. And he's one of those sort of masters where he might not say much, but he'll go and he'll fix one hand position like that and suddenly it's, it's like, oh, you know, it's, he, it's, it's genius to watch this. Um, you know, for me, I, uh, just the whole idea that two, two inches to the left or right could make such a difference, it's, it's incredible. So, um, so that's, that happens like that. Unlike opera, where you always have a set of rehearsals with orchestra and stage, in ballet we don't do that. So the first time the ballerinas hear their pas de deux is usually at the show, the first show, with orchestra. They've heard it with piano the whole time. That, the exception to that is when it's a new ballet or it's an interactive ballet. So this last week we did a ballet called The Concert, which is a Jerome Robbins piece, very funny. And a lot of the stage action relies on stuff coming out of the pit at just the right time. And so we had a, an orchestra stage rehearsal for that. We will have orchestra stage rehearsal for uh, Russian Sketches, which um, is a very complex piece that we're doing uh, next week. Uh, and also the Avopert Liturgy, which um, you can't replicate on a piano. Um, it's this sort of timeless piece that until, unless the dancers actually hear what it sounds like in the strings and the bass drum and claves and the solo violin, it's, mm. it, it's, it's very hard. So, so that's another piece that we'll do with the musicians. But most of the time, you know, and I said to Peter, is this a cost-cutting thing? And Peter Martin's the boss. Is this a cost-cutting thing? Why can't we have, why can't I have some orchestra stage time? Because like, yeah, I would learn something. And he said, no, 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 we didn't, even when Mr. B was there, he thought it was great that the dancers wouldn't actually hear that sound of a symphony orchestra until opening night. So it's a tradition, I guess. Wow. Yeah. That, that's really <laughs> astonishing. <Yeah. laughs> so is that, that's also true when it's a new work? No, when it's a new work, we'll have stage orchestra time. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there's, there's a new ballet, Ratmonsky's doing a new ballet, and we actually have two days of rehearsal with orchestra. And when I say two days of rehearsal, it's just 50 minutes each day. It's not like it's a whole day of rehearsal, but it's just, you know, it's amazing how fast everybody is. The players, of course, I expect them to be fast, but I watch these dancers, they'll get one correction like that, and then it's like, boom, onto the next thing. Mm. You know, there's no going back, let's start back at the beginning and try it again, you know, which you do as a musician. You know, you gotta get, get, get that sort of flow going. Not them, they're just so quick, it's like one fix, stop, go from there, you know. Yeah. And, and the, um, sometimes the places where we musicians have to start have very funny names. Uh, like there's a moment in the Tchaikovsky Third Piano Concerto, the Andante Cantabile, that's called Fred Astaire, 
Tchaikovsky would not have gotten that. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, once Peter's talking about Fred Astaire, I know exactly what he's talking about. So do you, Susan, right? <laughs> so it's a, part, it's a piano solo part. So, um, yeah, it's, it, that's a day at the office. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll rehearse yours from 10 to 1, and then I'll be with the dancers from 1 till 5.30. Uh -huh. Um, and they very often work up until 6.30 and the curtains at 7.30, so it's insanity. I've never seen wow. people work so hard in my life. You mentioned earlier that uh, in your score you'll put in things like, you know, Fred Astaire or, yeah. you know, little code names for something in the choreography. Right. Well, I th it's very important, but also, you know, in some of these ballets you really have to take visual cues. I mentioned the concert. Another one is um, Fancy Free, which we also did um, yesterday. And, you know, there's some things like he crouches or when he gets up, and that's your cue to start. Um, or when she gets up, the girl in yellow, when the girl in yellow gets up, so you're, so you don't know who it's going to be, you know, it could be one of five people. So, so um, there are all these cues, and of course, there's the West Side Story cue, he stabs him, you know. <laughs> you know that's, so that's where you put the cord, you know. So it's, it's you know. Yeah, so we're actually prepared to see some live performance now from the new piece you were talking about, Russian Seasons? Yeah, it's not, that's not so new, actually. That's, it's, it's part ah, of the Here and Now Festival that we're starting. Um, this, this has basically three choreographers represented. Um, of course, our own Justin Peck, and he's doing music by, I'm going to talk just about the music, Philip Glass, Martinu, Steve Reich, and so, um, Sovian Stevens, who's his it's like his Stravinsky. Uh, he does so much with him. Um, Christopher Wielden's doing, um, in fact, we open with this on Tuesday night, uh, his ballet Mercurial Maneuvers, which is the Shostakovich first piano concerto, some Ligeti solo piano music, the Avo Perret I mentioned, and the Gershwin American Rhapsody at the very fast tempo, not. Um, and then, not. And then the, third, the third evening is, is Alexei Ratmansky's uh, ballets. And as you mentioned, um, we're doing this thing called Russian Seasons. And this is, the music is by Leonid Dzyatnikov, who is a Ukrainian composer. And again, like Stravinsky and Balanchine, very good friends with Ratmansky. So um, the new Ratmansky ballet that we're doing will actually be, I think, the third uh, collaboration between them. Yeah. But this is the first one done for the New York City Ballet, I believe, from 2006. And um, since it's new to me, I've asked some of the dancers to come and talk about it. Megan, are you back here somewhere? Yeah, there you are, with microphone. <laughs> here. <laughs> here, come into the light so everybody can see you. Ladies and gentlemen, Megan Fairchild. Hi. <laughs> My debut with the New York City Ballet in Capella, Megan was Capella, so there's a very soft spot in my <laughs> um, But also, uh, you've been off injured, and today was your first day back. So, yes. And you were splendid. Thank she you. She was in the Bizet Symphony. So thanks, <laughs> and thanks also for being here. Absolutely. So tell us, you're going to do the fourth movement, mm -hmm. uh, which we call the cuckoo movement. Yeah. You'll see why when you hear it, but yeah. tell us a bit about it. Um, as with many of the ballets we do, there's not like a real story. Um, you know, we get little suggestions of what's kind of happening and inspiring our movement. But um, this actual, the first movement you'll see just now, Cuckoo, was choreographed the day of the premiere, uh, originally for that first cast, the day before, you know, hours before the first show. And, and the people in it were like, whoa, this is really weird. And they just were, were so confused with it. It's very random. And apparently it like was the, the hit of the night. Like, it's very witty and it's kind of playing with the music a little bit in a comical way. But uh, for this season, our inspiration that he told us, I think, you know, many times it's always a different thing. And a choreographer might, might give you the little tidbits can change from season to season. But this year he's told us um, that it's very morbid, that we have, uh, we're all dying and we just have seconds to live and we're there to comfort each other. And he also uh, kind of gave us a connection um, that we're, we're like family, but maybe family that doesn't like each other, but we care about each other, something dysfunctional. And, and there's a, we each have a bit of a drama that happens and, and we kind of affect each other, um, you know, our, the energy, you know, we're all connected. So. That's great, well yeah. thank you. <laughs> and uh, Gina's gonna come out. Georgina, come out and talk to us. This is uh, uh, Georgina Paskogan. Um, 
fresh from her run of cats. Um, anyway, welcome back to the company. Thank you. Uh, we missed you. So tell us about the second selection. The second selection is the eighth movement. And I was lucky enough to be part of the original cast of Russian Season, so someone else is dancing my part. I've since moved on to another role okay. in the ballet. But this original, um, this eighth movement, it does not have a cute name like the cuckoo. You can name it yourself if you so desire. Uh, it's based on the relationships between these four people that you see. We'll start off with two men, and you can kind of gauge with yourself. I'm not going to tell you what to think here. There's no real story, but they have a certain relationship. And then a woman enters, and she kind of mixes it up a bit. And you can see how one man kind of changes his direction and his interest. And then the fourth girl was my girl, and she kind of is the outlier the whole time. And you'll see how she tries to interact with the group and with her partner, and he kind of rebuffs her. And so there was, it's, I think Russian Seasons in general was something that Alexei wanted to keep true to, uh, like a folk dance. And you'll see some of that folk movement in this movement. And also just it, it kind of working upon like the relationships between real people and making it so you can um, relate to it. That's fascinating. You don't happen to know anything about the 10th movement, do you? The 10th movement? Well, the 10th movement was choreographed on um, my dear friend, Albert Evans. Oh. And he was such a phenomenal person and character in the room. And it was part of Cuckoo, too. I mean, you had these people. You had Albert Evans, Sophie on Silve, Jenny Ringer, and Jonathan Stafford. And those are very interesting personalities to have in a room. And, it was, and, and so he kind of played off that. And so Albert was just this magnetic performer and could create all of these special movements. And, and Taylor Stanley really does it justice and puts his own spin on it. And, and I'm just so happy to see him perform this. Well, thank you so much. We're going to do three movements from Russian Seasons. And thanks for explaining it. I'll take that I'm taking this. Yeah. <laughs>
that's, um, I mean, just such an amazing uh, display of the, the kind of brilliant talent I get to work with. Uh, and um, the uh, Kurt has all these, uh, there's also a vocalist, but big vocal part, big violin part. I obviously picked movements without the vocalist today, but the piece actually sounds pretty close to what you just heard because it's just string orchestra plus Kurt plus singer. So I also wanted to pick something that we could simulate here without missing too much. And so please do, if you don't already have tickets, come check it out. There's, I believe, four performances of it over the next two weeks starting this, this Wednesday. So um, it be, be great to have you there. You know, during this incredible festival, when you have so many pieces up for performance over a period of four weeks, like 43 works. Right. Yeah, it's, it's insanity, but that's what they do, you know? So, um, I, I, you know, when you're a symphony conductor, you have one program a week. You right, know, you know, you, you could take it a little easy, uh, you know, you could. No, I, I, you know, I really believe that the way to, the fastest way to learn something is to dive in with, right. you know, jump in with both feet. And so this, this week I conducted every performance. Um, and uh, so there was one ballet without music, the Jerome Robbins ballet. Um, and actually, you know, that was my least favorite part of the experience because you conduct the first piece and you conduct the last piece and then you have virtually 70 minutes in between. So you just get psyched up for the show and then you're like, oh. <laughs> you know, so uh, so that, that, was, that was the toughest part of the yeah. week actually, sitting yeah. around waiting to go on again. Um, but um, very, very exciting experience to put this uh, music together, this Ratmansky, um, again, I think an example of a, of a choreographer who, who fits his choreography to the music, and it's really exciting to watch. So we have a great finale coming up for you, but first we're just going to take a moment to ask one of the dancers to talk about this movement music thing from the dancer's point of view. Amar Ramasar, can you join us for a moment? Great, great. Yes. Stand in the lights. Light. Light. So, so we've been talking so much about how we as musicians, you know, need to grapple with things in the world of ballet and, and the great rewards of that. So I'm curious whether you can tell us as a dancer, someone who's grown up with movement, do you think you hear music differently from those of us, you know, who, if you go to a concert, does it sound different to you? Uh, yeah, I think um, we actually, as being instilled so early at School of American Ballet of music being so, such an importance, um, we look at ourselves as musical instruments, in a sense, you know? It's like we are part of the symphony, and we try to embrace and embody that, mu that music. Um, so, yeah, we definitely, like, I look, watched Taylor do that variation just now, and I saw a violin, you know? I saw Kurt, and, you know, and one, one and the other. So it's, uh, yeah, I think that that's really a blessing of being a dancer with that sense, is that you become part of the music. So you must have a very sort of physical, vicarious experience. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, that cuckoo. I was a cuckoo bird back there because I heard the cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, it's, it's almost, yeah, it's visceral, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a really, really yeah. important thing. So. Yeah, right. That's a, must be a great privilege to experience music. And Except at that, that tempo, way. Andrew, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually, and that's one thing I have to say also about Balanchine and the importance of him, because I think he, and it's so, it's in our technique, it's so based to move fast, and you want us to move faster and quicker, because the music was written that way. And there's so many times our teachers at School of American Ballet, I say, it's too fast. They go, no, you gotta dance faster. Right, and that's instilled in Balanchine, and uh, and and in Litton too. So it's awesome. <laughs> great. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, Thanks. you can take it. Yeah, yeah. great, great. Did you just want to set up the part of it? Yeah. Um, so I just I just want to say though, uh, he is to be Amar is just one of a typical example of the the talent I get to work with because they really do know music. You know, you, this, this whole idea that dancers just know counts. It's, it's incredible how, how much they know. And, and some of the ballet masters, uh, Rosemary Dunleavy, who's a, who's a legend, um, she can actually sing to us mere musicians exactly where she wants us to start, perfectly and in the right key. Mm -hmm. I don't think she knows that, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite impressive, you know. Instead of just saying from the third arabesque, you know, please start, you know, the menage. No, she just says, say, start from the da da. So we know exactly where that is. We're going to end with um, a crown jewel, if you will, of Balanchine. Uh, one of the movements from his Diamonds Ballet, which is part of the Jewels Ballet. Um, 
it's uh, this summer, Lincoln Center Festival is featuring Jules in a 50th anniversary festival of the, of the ballet, celebration of the ballet. And they've invited two other companies to take part with us. Uh, so the Paris Hopper Ballet will be here, the Bolshoi Ballet will be here, and the New York City Ballet. Uh, the Paris Hopper Ballet is doing the Emeralds Movement, which is music of foray. Um, and then the City Ballet and the Bolshoi Ballet will duke it out between rubies and diamonds and literally switch ballets every night. And there's a rumor going around the Coke Theater that they're actually going to put the sh have everybody share dressing rooms so that there'll be <laughs> all these, these different nationalities. Into, I don't know if they're listening backstage, but anyway, um, so, so it'll, that'll, be, that'll be very interesting, but um, I don't have to share with anybody because guess who's the only conductor, so. But talking about a nightmare of tempo uh, opinions, <laughs> and now we're gonna have to deal with ballet masters from two other companies too, but wow. it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Anyway. <laughs> The, one of the most beautiful things Tchaikovsky ever wrote is the slow movement from his third symphony. And this is, in fact, the second movement of, uh, of, of Diamonds, and we're going to get to see that now. So this is a big treat. Thank you so much for joining us, and please come and see us across town. We're good.